Okay. Welcome everyone to the second meeting in 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Everyone present is please reminded to switch off their mobile phones. Apologies have been received from Richard Lyle and John Finney, and I welcome Christine Graham to the meeting as a substitute committee member for Richard Lyle. Could I also say at the outset that uh, Hamza Youssef, the Minister of Transport for our Highlands and Islands, has, is unfortunately unwell today and will not be attending the committee meeting uh, to, to answer the questions that we had planned. It is it is proposed to reschedule a meeting with him at the earliest possible opportunity so we continue to uh, scrutinise the announcements and what is going on within Network Rail. Uh, agenda item one is the rail services in Scotland, Scott Rail Alliance. Today, the committee will take evidence on rail services in Scotland. And I would, at this stage, just prompt members if there is anyone that wants to declare any interest before we go any further. Uh, right, sorry, I'll take Gail first. Thank you, Convener. Um, uh, as is stated on my register of interests, I am the Vice President. Is the right time? <laughs> Vice President of Friends of the Far North Line. Sorry, I have so many others. That's, thank you. Thank you. Uh, John. Yeah, I'll go for it. Um, I'm a co-convener of the Cross-Party Group on Rail. Okay. Rhoda. Um, like, like Gail, I'm uh, um, uh, honorary Vice President of the North I Friends of the North Highland Line. Stuart. Uh, I'm one of 50 honorary Vice Presidents of Rail Future UK, and I'm the honorary Vice President of the Scottish Association for Public Transport. Neither of these roles carry any executive responsibilities. Christine. Well, I, I apparently have some interest to declare that I was unaware of, uh, except that perhaps I'm an honorary member of Campaign for Borders Rail, and the railway runs through my entire constituency, so it'll be no surprise to Mr Verso. I'll be asking him about Gosh, um, are there any other declarations of interest? Uh, so the committee had agreed that it would be very helpful to receive regular updates from the Scott Rail Alliance, and I'd like to welcome again Phil Verster, the Managing Director, David Dixon, Infrastructure Director, and Angus Tom, the Engineering Director for Scott Rail Alliance. I'd like to invite Mr. Verster to make an opening statement, please. Thank you very much, Convener and Committee, for the opportunity to uh, address you again today and to answer your questions. Um, it's much appreciated. And uh, David and Angus will, as directors in the Scott Rail Alliance, will will support me in covering some of the questions around performance. But just as a few introductory concepts, just three or four ideas. First of all, the Scott Rail Alliance is, has been set up and is focused on delivering customer satisfaction. One of our biggest drives on customer satisfaction is to deliver a punctual railway service as one of the key drivers that drive uh, customers' appreciation of what the railway delivers for them. And so when we cover the performance improvement plan today and the punctuality uh, improvements that we've delivered, you'll see that that's a central part of what we deliver. A second part of customer satisfaction, which is a key driver, especially at this time in Scotland, is the provision of capacity. Now, railway is extremely busy currently, and we have, in a record time, delivered the Class 385 uh, preparedness and fleet readiness for introduction later on this year, around September. And that additional capacity will make a massive change to uh, our service that we deliver and will add, uh, for example, on Edinburgh to Glasgow line, nearly 50% more capacity. And, and that would contribute to customer satisfaction in a very significant way. And thirdly, the driver of customer satisfaction is just what we do day to day. Um, it's what we do with stations. And we have significant um, innovation schemes and improvement schemes, stations such as Perth, Stirling, Aberdeen, Inverness, Motherwell, and the like. What we do with ticket vending machines, new gate lines, um, new CIS, new CCTV, introduction of smart ticketing, there's a huge number of things that we are delivering um, on a continuous basis, all aimed at improving our railway. And just as an observation, 
Um, I think the debate sometimes gets focused in one area, which is punctuality, and we will want to address that today very significantly, but it's often perhaps not focused on to see how much else we are delivering to improve Scotland's railway in, in, in a very significant way. And some of the things we're doing with, with new timetables that get implemented now in the next couple of months and into 2018 is going to be absolutely gigantic in terms of the impact it's going to have. Aberdeen to Inverness, capacity will increase by about 75%. Um, on, on those services. Some of the services are now, like in Veruri to Aberdeen, which is one train per hour, would go to two trains per hour and four trains per hour in the peak. It's just significant, and that's a very exciting place to be. And just then focus on the issue of, of, uh, um, of punctuality. Today we'll share with you why the 0.5% improvement over the last three months in, in our annual measure of performance is such a significant improvement and where we are going with this program into the future um, is really positive. We have achieved the 90% um, punctuality measure, 90% is sort of psychologically an important point to achieve and we'll continue to drive that in the right direction. And on our performance improvement plan, we've completed around 733 milestone actions out of 1,266 actions. We've now got 273 action plans instead of the 249 we had originally because it's a live plan that grows. This is an exciting time for us. A last thought, our people in our business, really important, and our people are really engaged, and, and we hope that with feedback such as what we give this committee today, we continue to create positive momentum behind what we do in ScotRail, which is confirmation to our people that we're doing the right thing and going in the right direction. Thank you very much, Mr. Convener. Thank you very much. Um, Stuart, I think you've got the first question. Uh, thank you very much, Kimian. And I want to uh, uh, pick up the challenge of the public performance measure, uh, which uh, you've, you've just been referring to. And perhaps before doing so, it's, it's worth saying, well, I think the travelling public will recognise the infrastructure upgrades that are being made, uh, very quickly they get used to them and don't notice they've been done, whereas the day-to-day -day performance of the actual train people get on is probably the most important thing uh, when, it, when it doesn't meet the required standard for anybody. So I think that's in the front of my mind when I'm asking um, my questions on public performance uh, measures. It, it's worth saying when I looked at today's measure at 8.50 this morning, it was helpfully for your purposes sitting at 91%, um, with the national figure sitting three percentage points lower at 88%. But that's one day. Um, I, th I think the, 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 the issue perhaps is, I heard you say that an improvement in the rolling, I think it was the rolling average, the MMA figure you were talking about, uh, had gone up by 0.5 and how significant that was. Now, I'd like you to perhaps develop and explain why that's significant because 0.5 percentage of a rise doesn't sound particularly impressive, particularly in the context of your still being uh, not yet achieving the 91%, which is the contractual target you're obligated to meet. Um, thank you very much for that question. Yeah. So, when you think of the moving annual average figure, that is an annual figure. So that measures an average of performance over a whole 12 months or 13 periods of four weeks each. So, where we have made a 0.5% improvement in three months to move from 89.5 to 90%, if you extrapolate half a percent over three months to that over a year over which the MAA is measured, then that becomes two percentage points that you move um, from the position you're at. So again, in terms of context, if you go three months ago, the difference between Scotland's performance and England and Wales's performance, which is all the other train operators in, in the United Kingdom, the gap between us was 1.8%. Scotland was performing 1.8% better than, than England and Wales. In the last three months, we have moved by half a percent upwards, and England and Wales have moved by 0.3 of a percent downwards. So the gap today in our performance relative to England and Wales um, which, you, which this, uh, uh, still is referred to there, 
is now 2.6% on a moving annual average. So we picked up on the fact that we're 3% different today. Over a period of a year, the, that gap is significant. It's 2.6%. And just to give context again, the whole of the United Kingdom Railway, as now for as long as I've been in it, which is about five, six years, um, and for longer, have aimed to get this MAA figure in the United Kingdom to 92 or 92.5%. And this is for around the last eight years or so, and have not achieved it. So when we move from 89.5 to 90% with a trajectory that is that positive, then if you think of nine months to go um, in terms of the year that we, from when we started our performance improvement program, and you think that the headroom that we're aiming at is between 90 and 92%, this is... This is, the large, this is the last returns to scale that we are focusing on. And, and, and that's reflected in our improvement plans. Our improvement plans, when you think of performance improvement plans across the network, across railways, they can either be aimed at, at fixing um, hosts of very clear problems or let's call it silver bullets that you need to fix in order to just fix big problems you've got. When you look at our performance improvement plan, it is at, an, at a stage beyond that. We are replacing, for example, and David will give examples of that, we are re replacing uh, 19 core cables and power cables I, preactively. I, I wonder if I might intervene because I suspect colleagues will probably want to explore some of the detailed infrastructure changes that are being made. Um, just a wee technical point. When you say UK, you mean GB, because you're not including the Irish figures. I am correct, am I? Yes. No, I, I, Ireland's figures are not included. It's England and Wales. Yeah, so it's GB, not UK, just to be, just to yeah. be clear about it. Um, and, and while it's a matter of some modest pride that we're substantially ahead of what the rest of this island is doing, at the end of the day, the measure this committee, I think, ought to be interested in is how you're doing on the trajectory your word, uh, to the 91%. Now, you've said you're on a trajectory. We've seen a half percent rise in a short space of time on the MMA figure. Are you going to reach the 91%? When are you going to reach that 91%? Because you use the word trajectory, which suggests in your mind that you see that curve continuing to meet the target. When are we going to get that? So I expect us, by March, to have cleared the 90.3% point at least, yep. the point that was the original trigger level of the performance that's, improvement plan. To be clear, clear that's the MMA. MM, MMA level, yes. Right. Okay. So by March, I expect us to have cleared that and to continue to improve from where we are. When you look at our performance improvement plan, and, and we'll discuss that in detail with, with examples as we get through the, the hearing today, um, how we improve depends very much on what type of faults we avoid on the network, what type, of, uh, what, what type of incidents we can avoid through the actions we're taking. And it's not, it's not always an exact science. Um, it is a good improvement plan. It has delivered for us over the last three months, and we will continue to deliver that and renew the plan and continue to get momentum behind an improvement uh, of, of that MAA trajectory. I can't tell you exactly we'll be at 91 or 91.3 or 91.7, but what I can tell you is we'll continue to put that uh, uh, plans together that will be live and throughout the next year continue to improve our MAA. Are there any uh, perceived obstacles to meeting that other than weather? No. No, they aren't. But when you look at the MAA trajectory, in the period May, June, July, August of last year, when we had the Queen Street blockade and the industrial action, there was a very clear impact on our performance. And so when we go into that period where those months had difficult performance levels around 91 and 90 percent. This year, those are the months when we will catch up 
with our MAA performance quite significantly. So the months between now and March last year were good months. So when we go into those this year, we need to be better than last year's in order to lift the MAA. And so the next three months are, 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 are high performance months. Um, but the MAA would probably move with a limited, to a limited extent. But we expect the second half of the year, when we get into summer and before summer, there are huge opportunities to continue to, to improve the MAA. Uh, let me just be clear, perhaps as a final point. Um, you, you've said that the next three months, that's January, February, March, uh, are challenging because, because you will find it difficult to beat the good performance that was 12 months ago. Correct. So as they drop out, we're replaced by this year's. Yes. But you've also said that you expect within that period the trend upwards to continue. If the months that are dropping out of the rolling average are similar to the ones you're bringing in, how that's, arithmetically can it be the case that's that the right. average rises? You're right. So, so, so that's why we are set to, to focus on improving on last year's numbers that right. are dropping out. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. Kimvira. Thank you. The next question is from, from Gail. Good morning. Um, I would like to um, also concentrate on just to following up from uh, Stuart Stevenson's <coughs> questions. Uh, when we look at the delays on the routes during both the last four week period and the year to um, the 10th of December 2016, um, we can conclude that Network Rail was responsible for half of all Scott Rail's delayed minutes. Now, given that Network Rail are an arm's length body and ultimate, ultimately responsible to the UK government, um, could you comment on these figures? And secondly, if you see any action that could be taken to reduce these delays that are caused by Network Rail? So, Network Rail is a full partner of our ScotRail Alliance, as is Abellio ScotRail. And we don't make that distinction um, between the two businesses when we look at running the railway. In the end, very similar to um, uh, uh, what a previous speaker said, this is the, the performance on the railway, this is all about what customers experience and how customers see. Customers don't really care which part of the railway is doing what and is accountable for what. They just want to travel from point A to point B as best they can, as best we can move them. So all of our plans are integrated plans, covers all of Network Rail's activity on infrastructure, covers all of Abellio Scott Rail's activity on operations um, and, and, and fleet, and, and front end of the business as in, on stations. Our plans are so integrated that you can't really pinpoint to any part of the business and say, well, this is yours or this is not yours. We have a very clear joint approach to deliver for our customers. And so when you think of, um, when you think of what we do to, in the performance improvement plan, it is really not about a division between two parts of the industry. That's what we've set the ScotRail Alliance to overcome so that there's not finger pointing between the businesses, but more momentum to deliver what's right for customers as a whole. And, and in terms of examples, when we, when, we, when we can get to that, we'll give examples of how those two teams work together. Okay, thank you for that. I appreciate that customers, all they want is for their trains to be on time and for their um, rail fares to be fair. Um, but as a committee, it's up to us to hold you to account. And I think that it is up to us to see who is responsible for which parts. Um, and given that the Transport Minister unfortunately can't be here today, but just this morning made a statement about further devolution of network rail, um, possibly bringing savings of £100 million every year. And given that network rail are part of the ScotRail Alliance, what benefits do you think that would bring? So... Sorry, can I just come in here in, in, in the sense that I think, I think that's a very important question, which, which Hamza, it would have been great if he'd been here to, to, to able to answer it. So 
Can I ask you to look at that purely from your point of view and, and, and not, not comment on, on anything he said? Because there is some confusion. I mean, I looked at uh, all the press releases this morning, and virtually every press release is, is based on, on a comment that he's made. So I'd welcome your, your thoughts on that, if I may. Very good. So if I, if I take anyone in Scotland today that are working either on our infrastructure projects or in the front line, um, in the middle of the snow up in Stirling this week, working on a set of points, or anyone on a station, everyone in Scotland works for Scotland's railway. So I don't sense on the ground where our people are making decisions every day that there's any, any deviation in their focus based on which company reports into where. There is a universal focus on what's good for Scotland's railway. And that's the bit I can comment on. Governments need to decide on where devolution, the lines of devolution is drawn. But for us, customers are, are, are all focused on continuously. Do you want to follow yeah, no, that's fine, John. Jo John, do you want to? Yes, I, th I think one or two of us, actually. I think Christine Graham's looking like she's interested. This, this topic is, is quite interesting because we've been given a figure that 53% of the reasons for delays is network rails. And then you're telling us, and I, I mean, I do very much welcome the fact that it is integrated. I think that's tremendous that it's integrated. But I'm struggling a wee bit to understand, um, I mean, there's two legal entities here, I think, although you're in charge of them both. So, so there clearly are distinctions between the two, and I, I'm, I'm delighted that the attitude of everybody is, is to get the railways running. Um, I mean, what difference would it make if, network, if you were in control of everything in network rail in Scotland? Would it not really make much difference at all? As, as the managing director of the ScotRail Alliance, with an employee, a director that works for network rail and a director that works for Abellio ScotRail, we are in charge of everything. So we are in charge of everything in Scotland's railway. And, 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 and to be honest, in Scotland, we are just miles ahead of collaborative working in comparison to the rest of England and Wales. So do you never come up against an issue where a network rail has a kind of GB policy that they do things in a certain way, and you might like to change that, but you're unable to change it because it's a GB policy? We come across problems like that all of the time when you work with two companies that are two different legal entities. So we expect to encounter those. But then we find ways to work around those. This is what we are doing. This is what the ScotRail Alliance is all about. It's about finding a way of delivering for customers between two parts of the industry that have legally been separated in 1995 into uh, train operating company and infrastructure management company. And so it is challenging what we do because at times there are conflicts between how two different parts of the industry want to work. And I think that's public knowledge and we share that publicly as well. <coughs> but this is not, a, as, as, as I put it and as my team look at it, this is not about looking what, about what divides us or separates us. This is about looking for things that join us together to get a better result for the customer out there. And, and this is why I think what we're doing in Scotland is so superbly important for the whole of the United Kingdom because you have seen lately um, in, 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 in England and Wales that Westminster have been starting to talk about the same direction of travel of integrating the infrastructure manager closer and more, um, more intimately with the train operating, um, train operating role. This is the right trend, and we are right in the front of, of, that, of that movement. Okay, thanks. John, uh, th this is uh, obviously getting everyone's interest. I see there's people queuing up all over to, to come in. So, Christine, if you could come in, and, and could I just say there I'll are several people after. Yeah, no, I'll be you. brief. I mean, I mean, I very much welcome the Alliance, but everybody blames ScotRail for delays. Everybody blames ScotRail, Abilio. And if I were in your position as the... With your other hat, Chief Executive of ScotRail, I'd be hopping mad that Network Rail were never, never having the finger pointed at them. You see, what concerns me is, and I, I do welcome the way you're going, is there is a distinct legal 
difference between you. And for example, in terms of liability and compensation for a failure on the network, who pays that? So, so very clearly, in order, in order to make sure that we are adhering to all of the principles about how the franchise was let, how government funds a network rail appropriately, and to make sure that all of the mechanisms is adhered to, there is nothing that has changed between network rail and Abellio Scott Rail in terms of dealing with what's called schedule eight payments, which is payments for this during disruption, either company to one another, or schedule four, which is about more access and giving access to the infrastructure manager to get um, work done on the network. So all of those mechanisms that are proven in the industry are still at year two. The two businesses have voluntarily put each other right next to each other, all of the mechanisms still work, put a single umbrella management team on and said, guys, work together and find ways to deliver better for customers. And that's exactly what we're doing. Just simply, uh, well, I think you saw it coming away there. Just simply, how, how can I express this? How hands-on, how you're chairing this alliance now, how much can you direct Network Rail and ensure, without offending Network Rail people, that the efficiency which impacts on your business, which is what the passenger cares about, is the train arriving in time and being at the station and so on. Are you in a position of really being able to change that or are you simply chairing it? No, absolutely. Absolutely, we affect that. And, and if I give, and I think I gave this committee a, a heads up at the, last, at the last session as well. When you look at what we deliver in Network Rail Scotland in terms of, for example, the, the renewals programs, which is track renewals, signaling renewals, bridges, a huge 340 million pound um, investment every year in infrastructure. As, as a business, we are driving, me and my team, with David leading uh, on that, are driving the efficiencies at which we deliver that at. We are on program with our renewals. We are one of the routes that are doing, the parts of the United Kingdom that's doing the best in terms of achieving our volumes of renewals. And, and we are proud of that. And, and if I go one step further to infrastructure projects, our electrification projects, even though some of them have had cost challenges, but our unit rate for delivering electrification projects is the lowest in the, in the United Kingdom compared to other, other, um, other parts of the United Kingdom. And we have direct control over that. Now, it may be that parts of Network Rail do not report directly into us, but as I think I've said to this committee before, what we have done very practically in Scotland is we've said, put our arms around all of the railway in Scotland and say, don't, don't really matter where, who you report into, in Scotland, you are delivering for Scotland's customers. And that is what your focus should be. And we're achieving that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Raider, I think you want to come in on yeah, that. Yeah, can I um, ask some questions about um, the latest figures um, for period 10, um, which do show an improvement in network rails um, cost delays. Um, but actually, the train operator cost to self-delays have increased by 5%. Is there a specific reason for that happening or between period 9 and period 10? One of the, one of the biggest contributors that we've had have been train-related failures. And I'd like to ask Angus. He's done, Angus and his team has done a huge amount of work to address that. And in the last periods, that performance has improved. So, Angus. Yeah, so if it, um Look at the, the fleet for the last four periods, that's technical failures with our trains. is actually on target and where we expect it to be. Um, part of the, the reason for that is some of the uh, performance improvement plan actions that we've been carrying out and in place. I'll just give you one example. So the Class 334 fleet, which operates Helensbury, Airdrie into uh, Waverley, and obviously other routes within Scotland, but um, kind of the main route for them. Or between the months of November and December, we renewed um, 80 couplers across the fleet. Now, for what that is, is when two trains join together. So you have a three car and a three car, um, and they join together, you use these couplers to make the six car. One of the, you know, one of the things that affects customers the most is when they get a short form service. So when a train they expect to come to a station has 
Uh, only three cars are expecting six. Obviously, it's more cramped, there's less room, and more people are standing. So we had an ambitious programme to change these couplers out uh, over these two months. We achieved it on budget and to plan. And what we've seen now is a clear um, kind of performance benefit and customer benefit on the routes that the 334 operate. The coupler we fitted is the same type of coupler that is now fit, is going to be fitted to the brand new trains, the 385s. It's the mo most modern coupler we have. Um, and that has shown that the fleet, as last period, which is the last four weeks, had the most reliable fleet or, uh, performance period on record um, for that class. So things, you know, the work we're doing is delivering uh, performance improvements and definite benefits for the customer. But how did, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to drive out um, how perform, well, how, how delays were increased by, and it says, um, train operator. Are you saying that you were taking trains off routes, which caused increased um, delays? Um, to have this work done, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy that work's been done because one of my questions was about overcrowding. But how has that impacted on your figures to show an increase of five percent in delays caused by the operator? So, when one works with these percentages about how delays are split between the two companies, um, the percentage is often affected by what happens on the other part of the business as well, because even if the delay minute stays exactly the same for the Bellio Scott Rail side of the business, but it gets less on the network rail side of the business because there's a better period on infrastructure, that percentage ratio of the total on the train operating side will increase. So it's, it's percentages, and, 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 and it's sometimes an awkward thing when you try to compare. And on the infrastructure side, over the last two periods, we've had a distinct improvement in performance relative to earlier periods. So um, I think what we can do is we can take that question away and come back with a more detailed explanation of what the movements are. We don't, I don't have the 38% or the 54% numbers exactly in front of me, but if that meets your requirements, we'll take that away and come back to you. That, that would be really helpful. And also, just on, on the issue of overcrowding, I think we're promised figures on overcrowding last year, and if work is being undertaken, it would be quite good to see what those figures were and how they are we, improving going forward. We, the work taking. we will publish um, the most overcrowded trains, the data on the 10 most overcrowded trains, and what we do, what plans we have in place to address that within the next two weeks. Okay. Um, and just sorry, just just on that, yep. um, when there are specific events taking place, that is a big issue for overcrowding trains that may normally be quiet. Say a big football game, rugby match, or whatever. Yep. But it would be interesting to hear at the same time what steps you're taking to put on extra services to deal with that. So, so we've got a team that look at events throughout the year, and and that's that's all they do. They do nothing else but look at events. And when we have events on, whether it's rugby at Murrayfield or um, appearances of, of, uh, of bands at the Hydro or, what, or events at the SECC, we take our rolling stock, those events, and we lay on alternative services and special and extra services. Uh, we work very closely with events, um, uh, events companies. We work intimately um, with them to understand what are the loadings that are expected from us by train or by rail, what will be the travel requirements. We've got our own history of how people travel, and we use all of that to size the stock that we provide. Similarly for things like um, the, the, the Edinburgh festivals as well. During that period of the year, we, we adjust our programs and where rolling stock run in order to accommodate those loadings. Can I say, I appreciate that, and that, that, that's a fairly full answer. It would be very helpful for the committee to get some figures on, on how you're achieving and some comment on how you're achieving those targets and the information. So we'd, we'd welcome a written uh, submission once you have those details to hand. We will do that. Um, that would be extremely helpful. You're right on that. Yes, uh, we're also going to provide us with a breakdown of the figures showing the increase of delays. The, yes. and, the, and the proportional the movement, proportional we'll do tonight. that, yes. yes. Stuart wants to come in and then it's, John. It's just a wee quickie for Angus Tom on couplers. I understand uh, from a signaller and from a conductor that the Princess Street uh, blockade was essentially an electrical coupling problem. Uh, 
And it wasn't on a 334, I understand. It was on a... 156. 156, uh, 156 <clears throat> right. Is there a generic problem across the fleet with couplers? Because some of the supplementary information I've been given informally suggests there have been a history of coupler failures on exiting the Haymarket Yard, for example, which fortunately has not been affecting network operations, but shows there's potentially a systemic problem. I heard you say, Mr. Tom, that you were replacing couplers. Is this going to be really across the whole fleet in the light of that particular failure and my unconfirmed statement, which I've got from a third party about there being a systemic problem? Okay, if we, if we tackle the, the Waverley incident, which was an unfortunate incident and caused significant delay uh, and upset to our customers, um, the root cause of that was damage to one of the coupler boxes. Um, it's been treated as a one-off, so we don't, it's unlikely to happen again, and the rest of the fleet has been checked to ensure that there's no damage uh, to the rest of the 156 fleet. Uh, visually, the damage that was there, you couldn't see by the eye. It was something that would have to require special gauging equipment to understand the failure mechanism. And what happened was this failure was on the train, and when it went over the tight bend at Waverley, the electrical connections braked, and the train came to a stand, which is designed to do in such an event. The issues you're talking about um, from Haymarket, uh, fortunately, I've been in Scotrail now for almost 12 years, and remember um, those incidents. They are historic. They will not be happening again. The trains were modified to ensure that that type of incident couldn't happen. Efficient, thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm conscious that uh, we're you know, working through a, through a list of questions uh, and we're not very far through them and, and time is marching on. So I'd like to move on, if I may, and Rhoda's got a question just on, on uh, performance levels. And, and Phil, if I could ask, you, you've been very good in giving us very full answers. That, that the tighter you can keep the answers, the, the more we'd appreciate. Um, you, you spoke about the performance level and where you thought we would be. I mean, obviously the target is 91%, um, but that, the ORR has said to us that's challenging depending on winter conditions. Um, do you think the winter conditions to date have been helpful? Do you think that will, and I know you, you, you have already said that level is challenging, but what kind of winter conditions would, I suppose, stop you achieving that, or do you believe it's not so much winter conditions as um, it is challenging in itself? Uh, good morning. Um, in terms of winter, winter so far has been fairly typical. I think uh, everyone would recognise that. That It does bring individual challenges, and while in the central belt last week we didn't see too much by way of snow, if you went out into other parts of the network undoubtedly you, you saw quite extensive snowfall that affected um, particularly actually the roads and, and less so uh, the railway thankfully. Um, but it would need to be um, fairly extreme, it would need to be as extreme as it was four or five years ago to start to take effect uh, on the railway. Snow is always a, a difficult thing to deal with. Although we have uh, our points heated, etc. They are more designed for frost type scenarios. So sometimes you get into very kind of manual response to how you deal with heavy snowfall. But we do have a fleet that uh, deals with um, the more extreme conditions. We actually have some unique plant up here. In fact, the minister was uh, out visiting uh, recently our winter development train, which is unique to Scotland, which literally clears junctions of snow and ice, uh, which no other part of the UK actually has. So. To date, we've seen probably a fairly typical winter. Um, the things that really tend to damage us, though, are extreme wind. That's the events that have really um, had, had great effect on, on us in the past. And if you look back to last year and the storms, it was these big storm events um, with objects coming down in line. And we obviously have to put in all sorts of safety limits because we don't want trains striking objects. That's the last thing we want. Um, and these tend to be the really big things that we ultimately have to put on some sort of safety constraint in terms of either speed restrictions or, or closing lines. Um, so they're the really extreme kind of things that, that would tend to stop us. The kind of cold nights, the typical kind of just dreek wet is just what we deal with in winter. Yes, it, it can affect our equipment, but it's the much more extreme end, the kind of storm type scenarios that hit us more. We've certainly become much better at dealing with water and you see a lot less flooding. Uh, closing the railway than typically we saw in the past, which is good. We've had a lot of focus groups looking at problem areas and addressing them and improving our drainage. So we've done a lot of that, but it is still these big storm events. High winds particularly typically are the ones that really do tend to, 
hit us badly. So if there's fewer storms this winter, it could help you achieve ab that 91% yep. from last year. Can I just ask on the heated points, is that universal? No, about 80% of our points are heated. Um, we, we kind of know where others are and, and we can treat them. So if, if they're necessary, we can treat them. A lot of the points are in sidings and things like that as, as well that aren't heated. So we, we, we don't need to worry too much about them. Um, so we have plans that deal with both the heated and the unheated. We can identify remotely that they're working correctly. Um, so it, it's, a, it's probably the right balance in terms of how we deal with uh, keeping our, our points clear of, of frost. Okay. So thank you, David. No excuses for the winter. I think Christine's now got a question on the Borders Railway. Oh, yes, um, part three parts if that's all right, convener. Uh, first of all, can I commend ScotRail and Network Rail for the delivery and the way the line has operated? I mean, it's been superb and it's been very successful. But perhaps because it was people that campaigned for this, very high expectations and high tests. So I want to pick you up on three things on the performance of the railway um, to date. One was on uh, skip stops, which was causing a lot of concern, which I understand on peak... You were stopping doing that so that people were getting off where they wanted. Want to know how that's, if that's been held 100%. But what about off-peak? Because not just well, constituents myself, it took me two hours to do it, to go backwards and forwards to try and pick up my car at a station you'd skipped. I know you didn't do it to me deliberately, but, you know, it's, it's not a good experience. The second thing is, uh, <laughs> the second thing is ticket checking and selling of tickets on the train. I have been in several trains and many have complained to me that there's nobody collecting or allowing tickets to be purchased. Now, at many stations, there isn't on one side of the line where there's twin tracks an ability to purchase tickets, so you're losing revenue. And as I understand it, there is a second person on the train. Why is that not happening? And thirdly, I noted when you were talking about events, um, do you have spare carriages? Does ScotRail be able to have spare carriages? when there are pressures throughout Scotland for additional carriages, say, during Hogmanay, or common ridings, or things like that, or, you know, we just have to pinch them from somebody else to deliver elsewhere. That's my question. Thank you very much. Uh, that was quite a short question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so we'll Phil, perhaps you'd like to go through those three points. And very if, quickly. And, and, and if I, I could say, if, if there's some of the facts and figures that you don't have, again, we'd welcome those to be set down in writing to us. But if you could answer it as, uh, as uh, detailedly as you can, please. On, skip, on, on ex running trains express or skipping stations, um, we've implemented a, a very clear policy that for trains travelling into <coughs> big city centres and conurbations, at a particular, particular times within the peak, we will not skip stop. As well as trains traveling out from big city centers in the evening, at particular times within the peak, we will not skip stop either. Just to confirm one thing, the reason why at times we will skip stop in the off peak is not because we want the train that is running to get to the end destination in time, that's not the reason. The moment we skip stop a train uh, past the station, that train is counted as having failed its punctuality. The reason why we skip stop some stations is the network is interconnected and a train that's running late over here can hold up 10, 12, 17, 20 other trains. So and very often people don't understand that. So the practice of skip stopping is practiced throughout all railways in the world. It's just when we do it to have the minimum customer impact. And we're sticking to that, and any change to that must be signed off by myself or the ops director. On the second question, we always have a second person on the train. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not sure about the issues, about where tickets aren't being sold or that experience, and I'll gladly take that up after the meeting and follow up on that. And in terms of extra carriages, we have recently um, squeezed a further class 158 out of Angus's maintenance allowance to put one extra two car on the border service. And we've been running that since, um, since December, which provides more capacity on borders. And that's a massive, massive benefit for the borders railway. Your question about what we do when there are big contingencies um, uh, or big events um, on, on other parts of the network is a really valid question. 
Um, and in those cases... I hope the rest were valid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and in those cases where we need extra rolling stock, we do make decisions in terms of what services we can run on other parts of the network, and we do then have to make compromises in terms of okay. uh, providing an increased level of capacity. Okay, thank you very much. So is, you're happy I don't know, I'm a visitor, so I, I think I've asked to see okay. you. I'll write about others. Stuart, Stuart, you've got some questions on, on performance, I think. Uh, yes, I suspect this will be for Mr. Dixon. Uh, Basically, I just want to probe a little bit about the Commercial Assurance Review and Rail Major Projects, uh, which has been a, a subject of uh, some discussion uh, and, uh, and debate, uh, whether projects are being managed the way that they need to be. In particular, there's a potential uh, increase uh, in the cost of major Scottish rail projects of £379 million. I just won wonder whether that's the right figure, for one thing, uh, and secondly, uh, what actions we're taking to uh, <coughs> give greater predictability of costs, but also to keep the costs uh, to the practical levels that are required in uh, the light of money that's available. So, capital projects um, are delivered by our IP business, Carl Budge, who joined me here last time, is accountable for that, and it's accountable to me for that. So I'll respond to that question. The, the, the number of 379 million that was used in the Ernest and Young report is not accurate. Um, well, say it's not accurate, we don't recognize it and things have moved on. We agree on a trilateral basis with the ORR and TS um, exactly what uh, cost movements on the AFCs for projects are. And the correct number is a movement of 293 million, which is still a lot of money. It's still 300 million movement. And, and Network Rail has, 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 has at, very clearly um, admitted that the process for CP5 to price projects and estimate projects um, can be improved and has to be improved. And that's an improvement that's not only a Network Rail side improvement, but total industry from the client side, meaning whether it's DFT or TS as well, um, is to have a process where programs are more mature in their development and can be priced better. And I think last time I gave examples on Aberdeen to Inverness where there was a four kilometer track renewal envisaged because of the desktop exercise it indicated that, but when you get into the detail of the design, there's 15 kilometers of track renewal required and all of a sudden the costs are in a different place. So there are three observations that are really important for this committee to just consider with regard to the cost of capital projects. And the first one is that because of the estimation quirks, um, inaccuracies, um, the 300 million pound movement is not a movement as slippage. <coughs> what, you, what we are delivering in Scotland is worth more than what the original estimate was because the estimates were incomplete still getting the right quality product, and, and that is important. So that'll be a first observation. Make a second observation is that part of that 300 million was slippage. If you look at the Edinburgh to Glasgow electrification project, um, when, when, when I got to Scotland a year and a half ago, we saw stuff, we saw problems, um, which came out of the woodwork after six months in terms of uh, difficulties to deliver um, within bad weather periods and stuff like that, and that the program had not delivered on time, and that there were things that can be done better, so acknowledge that. Then there's a third, um, a third driver of the cost, especially on electrification projects. The standards to which electrification is being delivered have been changed, and, and while there's this initial response to adopt the new st standards was um, delayed because there was a time of exchange with the ORR on what's the appropriate adoption of standards and the cost impacts of that, except that that delay came in. But the standards have changed and we are now delivering um, two <coughs> electrification standards that's of a significantly higher uh, a, a standard than what we had originally. So you take examples like parapet heights are now 1.8 meters instead of 1.5 meters, so it's safer for pedestrians. Clearances at stations are higher for the, of, of the live conductor relative to where passengers are. It's a different standard, and I think we've discussed that before. It's an international standard, it's, it's a TSI for Europe. And so, just in terms of understanding that movement of 293 million pounds, it is a different product 
that we are delivering, and it's a modern product for Scotland. Um, I'll just ask one more point. I know my colleague, uh, Mike Rumbles, wants to talk about Inverness Aberdeen specifically, so I won't go there. But basically, you were anchoring a significant part of the issue on inadequate estimating at the outset. Why was that inadequate? Was it because there was inadequate contingency as a factor to cover those matters which could not be known at the <coughs> point you do the initial estimate? Or was it that the models are inaccurate? You know, what basically underlay that inability to do that first estimate to something that was a better approximation at the final outcome? And what steps have you taken to make it better in future? I think the biggest driver um, was the fact that there was a process approach to getting the budgets defined and getting the budgets clarified before um, the control period starts. So part of that process approach meant that what we have as group four, which is basically the detailed design phase, would follow during a control period. So before the control period starts, clients, was, clients meaning DFT or TS, were saying, please, quite rightly saying, please tell me what will it cost to do that project over there. But with the group four stage not completed yet, the design was not in place. Sorry, sorry let, me, let me intervene. I understand all that. I used to lecture on project management, so I, know, I understand perfectly. But is it not the case that with experience, you ought to be able to predict what unknowns will become known during the grip four process and what relation they will have to the estimates when you're not in possession of the knowledge of what will emerge at grip four and thus put in place the appropriate contingency to cover the currently unknown but later will be known activities. Is it not proper that you, you, you take that historic view on previous projects and factor it into the way you do it now? So, you know, I'm not buying the excuse that because you haven't done GRIP4 yet, yeah. you can't even know what it is because you will never know until you finish the project if you carry that argument to its full extent. Absolutely, Mr. Stevenson, you're right. You're absolutely right. It is about um, using previous knowledge and understanding of what typical costs are. Let me pick an example, though, because examples help. Uh, I don't want to cut you short, but if the example is brief. Example is brief. Aberdeen to Inverness. Uh, we should anticipate what Mr. Rumbles may ask. <laughs> Aberdeen to Inverness. We've made an assumption on where the twin tracking is, uh, or twin tr tracking will be, that we could fit it within the existing boundaries of mm. our property. And when you look now at how to get the twin tracking mm. in, we have to have either land take or more expensive earthworks. That was not envisaged at the stage of the desktop exercise. Even though the desktop exercise goes to a certain extent into the depth of the design, where all of the points that Mr. Stevenson identified is considered. I, but just, when you get going, to the detailed going, design, that yeah. is when the real facts come, come at you and you understand what you can no, implement. I, I understand that point. I'm, just going to, I'm not going to invite further comment, but I just make the comment that's merely confirming to me that you're not making adequate cover for things you can't know at an earlier stage in the GRIP process that will emerge later. And I just invite you to further consider that. Um, and I think I'm going to leave it there, but I am just going to ask one question myself, if I may, on the review of major rail projects, the executive summary re recommendations. This was the one published on the 26th. There are various uh, uh, people tasked to complete various things of it. Uh, and timescales given. I, uh, just a straight answer, if I may, yes or no will do. Are we within the timescales that are laid out within the report to achieve all the things that were laid out within the executive summary? Yes. Thank you. Uh, John's now got a question on, on electrification, I believe. Thanks. Well, you, you've mentioned the Edinburgh Glasgow Improvement Project, so it was to ask you uh, for an update on that, um, because previously you gave us a, a, a number of dates like a uh, rolling stock starting to arrive in September, testing in December, and so on. So there'll be the two aspects, the actual rolling stock, is it coming along on time, and the electrification of the track, is that coming along on time? It is. So class three, uh, um, class three eight fives 
Uh, we've delivered the first unit, is now running on the Guruk line in test. Very excited about that. We have, in a record time, from finalization of design to train on track, uh, brought a class 385 into Scotland. Um, ex the testing, I reviewed it yesterday with Hitachi, is going superbly well, and we, are we will be delivering the first class 385s onto the network um, in September. Um, in terms of uh, completing the electrification of, uh, of, of, of Edinburgh to Glasgow, that's on track as well. Um, I can say to this committee that we are trying to pull it forward from the July date, and we are working really hard to get to the stage where we can, um, let's put it this way, benefit our customers significantly by introducing um, electric rolling stock on Edinburgh to Glasgow from the May timetable change. So we're working really hard to get electrification completed early. Um, and if we can implement it early, we'll be running electrified trains earlier. Right, thank you, that sounds positive. And uh, the other point would be Glasgow Queen Street redevelopment. Can you give us any update on how that's progressing? Is it on track as well? So for the Queen Street redevelopment, um, there's a significant risk, uh, which we have not been able to size currently and which will be resolved in the next couple of months. And that risk is associated with the Transport and Works Scotland order that we've submitted for the development. Now, we expected the, the TORS unit to report back um, to the minister in July of last year, and the revised date for the report back is in January of this year, or February. And, and, and the reason why that's an undefined exposure is, is we, we're not sure exactly what the TORS unit are going to advise and what needs to be done to address what the TORS unit advise. Now, we've got initial questions back and we're busy working through a response to that. And, and obviously, this is an important stage for us because it can affect the sequencing of works. We have had to delay the start of works. We're doing some of the preliminary works as we can, but the main program for, for Queen Street is not yet kicked off to the extent that we wanted to kick it off by the back end of last year. And that will have consequences for our delivery of key outputs three and key outputs four on Egypt. But we can't size those impacts yet, and we're working very closely with TS. This is clearly a risk that um, sits outside of uh, Network Rail's ability to uh, control or ambit of control to manage. So, so when do you think maybe three months from now you'll have a clearer <coughs> picture? Um, I think three months from now we will definitely have a better picture. Um, we've already proposed on, previous, at, on a previous occasion, we've already proposed to Transport Scotland three scenarios of if the TORS unit responds by this date, this is the potential impact I'll have on program. If by that date, that'll be the impact on program. Um, and we're already now in that zone where the impact on program is definite. Uh, we just don't know what it is. But three months from now, we should be able to give you an impact, uh, assessment. I think the committee would find uh, sight of those dates very useful so that we, we could see them. I, I don't know whether that breaches any confidentiality, but the more inf information you could give us at an earlier stage allows us to assess it. So we'll, do, we'll do so, convener. Okay. Um, Mike, you want to go on to the um, Aberdeen to Inverness journey timer and... I would ask you to, to keep it short, which we know the journey time isn't. But um. Yeah, I mean, I've just got two questions. Firstly, uh, in your last appearance on the 21st of September, and, and, and your answer to my question, if I can quote your answer, you said, um, with the Aberdeen to Inverness program, we will deliver a 75% increase in seat capacity on weekdays. You just said that again. But then you went on to say, you said that a service every quarter of an hour would be attractive, but you will get a service every half hour which is fantastic for that part of our network. We are very excited about that. And then when I asked when will this be delivered, and you said December 2019, that was between Inverness and Aberdeen. And you mentioned Inverurie. And when I, other people have raised this with me, that they, 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 quite, they think that, that might, you might have been referring to Inverurie to Aberdeen rather than Inverness to Aberdeen. Which yeah. is it? Our, our plan has always been to have, if you, if you look at the, the full service, Aberdeen to Inverness, mm. is two hourly. Mm. And then when you look at the Inveruri into Aberdeen mm. section, becomes half hourly and quarter of an hour in the peak. 
That's so the capacity that we've always published. That's what we've always yeah, said. But, but what you actually said to me was, when we, we were specifically talking about the Inverness Aberdeen, that's why I said that's remarkable. And you said that was fantastic. But, but it's, so it's not a half-hour service. It's not going to be a half-an-hour service. Not, not across the full stretch. It's, it's just to Inveruri. Inveruri is the one, uh, two trains well, per hour. Some people were very excited hourly. about what you said to us last time. So they'll be a bit disappointed now. I, I, I think, I think our, our plans are so well published on what we, what we are doing, so well consulted as well, um, that if there was a misunderstanding, um, I apologize, but the plans now have been consulted clearly. Okay, yeah. okay. My, yeah. my second part of the question is, if all you, this all work is being done on the Aberdeen to Inverness line, a number of people, particularly disabled people, have said to me, they cannot understand, I'll give you just one example, Inch Railway Station between Huntley and Inveruri. There's, there's no disabled access going in there as far as we're being told. Could you confirm whether that's true or not? And if it's not, if, if there's not disabled access to the railway stations in the 21st century, should they not be? Can't agree with you more. Um, when you look at access for all, which is this, the vehicle through which access for all um, and access for people with reduced mobility is achieved. Um, access for All is a program that Transport Scotland and the DFT very clearly manage and set priorities in terms of what stations get um, access for all infrastructure. As you can imagine, um, lifts and the like um, are sort of quite expensive, and the program to roll that out is set by Transport Scotland and DFT. And clearly, where we can, everywhere where we can, part of our design principles for every station is to get step-free access when we work through what, uh, how the access, how the station is uh, used and how the station is located. And step-free access can be achieved very often, perhaps, with uh, a bridge that exists close to a station that allows people to uh, um, get access from the public section. Well, Flo, I think you, you are explaining very reasonably uh, what you try and achieve. I think this was a particular question on inch yeah. station. Could, and could and you may I just ask you to focus purely on inch station. Is it, is it going to have disabled access or is it not? I can't respond on that, could on the I detail you, of that. I can could, take that away and could, come back to you and you, tell you what you, the conditions are. Could you write to me? Because the, I, I, in, oh, in, in, in a, station, there is a flat area of access, and I cannot understand, and my constituents right. can't understand, why this is not being planned for. My, Mike, okay, right. I, I don't want to take away from you. And, and, and uh, Phil, if I could ask you to write to the committee with your answer, we will, we'll of do. course, make sure that Mike gets it. Now, there are two follow-up questions on, on this particular line. Rhoda first, and then Murray. You talked about groundworks causing a delay in the improvement. Can I ask if there's any other reason for that delay? And also, talking about Inveruri and the level of service, given the Dalcross station coming online to Inverness Airport, will there be an improvement in service between Inverness and Dalcross when that happens to allow passengers back and forth? So, when we think of Inverness um, to Elgin, we are moving there from currently the two trains per hour to one train per hour. So the service would, would um, uh, so, so one train every two hours to one train per hour. Um, yeah. I was getting nervous. Because yeah. that's my line. <laughs> Apologies. Um, so, so the service improvement there is, is a doubling of the service. Um, and, and the context of, of the example on, on, on Earthworks was not to attribute delays to the program just to that one example. Um, the program for Aberdeen to Inverness is a capacity program, not a journey time improvement program. That capacity program will be delivered by December 2019. So the, the date will move for completion from April 2019 to December 2019. We've taken the whole project, which is now a massive project in terms of all of the detailed work that has been done. It has impacted, therefore, on, the, on, on, on delivery. But we are letting the first contracts for the design phase on signaling on the western side of the, of, of the program. Um, 
imminently in February, and by May we'll be letting the design or the GRIP4 stage of, of both track and signaling for the east side to, to another contractor as well. So the program is moving forward. The work at, at Forest and Elgin are, are, are happening and preliminary works are happening. So it's all systems go with that program. Nine months late. Yeah. It's okay. Mary, do you want to? Yes, it was more a question really about capacity on the East Coast and about the, the Usin, the Usin uh, connection in particular, where there's single track there. And I know there's been some talk about possibly double tracking that. And it was just really to get your views on whether uh, on the bottleneck there, is that a big restriction on the, the capacity that you have at the moment? And would that ease a lot of the issues for you if that, if that was to be double tracked? You're referring to Portobello Junction? I, no, this is at Uzin Junction. It's in Montrose. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, look, if you look, if, if you consider our, our whole plan, our study of the route, Scotland route study, that Scotland route study that plans in advance what capacity we have in what locations and what physical capacity we need, be it two tracking or be it... Um, different signaling or, or the like, already considers what our timetable requirements are for the future, how many people we have to move and uh, how many trains we have to run. So where we have constraints, they will be identified as we go through the different control periods and that's not an immediate constraint at this stage. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to move on uh, to the Highland Line. Um, and, and hopefully there's going to be no uh, mix-up of figures and cuts here. Gail's got a question for you on that. Um, thank you, Convener. Yes, Highland Mainline. <coughs> Network Rail Monitor considers the Highland Mainline Journey Time Improvements Project. I just wondered if you could give us an update on the delivery of that, um, particularly expected timescale for delivery cost and expected benefits to passengers and freight customers, please. So on the, on the Highland Mainline, um, we are currently still forecasting a completion cost of £65 million, <coughs> which is less than the um, control period value of £117 million. Uh, and we expect some of the benefits from the revised solution that we've put forward, which is a combination of both infrastructure um, as part of the solution, as well as using the HSTs as, as, as a part of the solution. Um, to be around 13 minutes in journey time currently, which exceeds the original target that was set at 10, 10 minutes, uh, but that is to be confirmed. So we're still looking at the timetable. With the 65 million, there could be plans to include more um, bridge work or station, station bridges, even access for all schemes, but that's being finalized as we speak. That program is still on track to complete by April 2019. No, that's fine, thanks. Okay, thank you. On that, we're... we're sorry, Rhoda, yeah. Can I just ask a question on the North Highland line, which yes. I would have asked yeah. the, the Minister had he been here. And you'll be aware of the review group that's been set up that Fergus Young um, announced. What's your understanding of that, and what will that bring to the table that you wouldn't be bringing? I mean, we all know that it's in dire need of improvement. What can they bring um, that you wouldn't have been planning to bring? So... We have a, in our performance improvement plan, we already have quite a lot of actions that would cover the Far North Line as well as the Kyle Line in terms of improvements. But what we'll get from that review group is a single forum where we can involve communities in the decision making of, uh, of the improvements we're delivering. Get better communication back to the communities, better involvement of the communities. And even though we have with our, our leaders up in Inverness that are running the railway up in Inverness, although we already have good interaction with communities, the formalized structure um, that, that Mr. Ewing has proposed provides a really good basis from which we will share with communities exactly what we, what we, what we plan to do and also listen to communities in terms of what's important to them. And so it's a communication project as Absolutely. opposed to proposing? Absolutely. Okay. Okay, I think we're going to move on now to a question uh, from John. Yeah, well, back to electrification. Um, I mean, the Office 
of road and rail uh, regulation um, has raised questions, I think, about the budget for the electrification of the Shorts line and the Stirling and Blaine Alloa lines. Can you give us any kind of update on these projects? So the Shorts line electrification is progressing well. Um, we, we clearly have very serious um, and very important interactions with communities along that line because electrification projects by their nature, when you start to lift bridges, affects communities significantly. Um, and and that's, just, that's just sort of the type of thing we manage and must manage on an ongoing basis. Uh, at West Calder, for example, we're replacing a line and closing the A71 for 16 weeks. Stuff like that have a big impact on communities. We're very sensitive to that and we communicate very widely on instances <laughs> like that. So the SHOTS program is, is progressing really well. On Sterling Dunblane Alloa, um, I referred you to an earlier comment um, and also a comment I made at the previous appearance here about adopting for electrification a different set of standards, um, which are um, the European TSIs. Um, which requires us to have different levels of clearances. So we've reviewed the initial work that had been done on structures on Stirling Dunblane Alloa, and there are three structures which, we'll, which we will have to um, uh, adjust in order to comply with the standards. Two of them, two of those are bridge structures which we can see solutions for. The one that's really challenging is the footbridge at Stir in Stirling Station. That's a... Um, that's a, a protected... Not, not, not the new footbridge, surely. No, not the new footbridge, no, no, the no, old no, one. No, right, okay. The old one. It's, it's a protected structure. Um, and uh, in order to get the right clearances under that uh, protected structure, we, we will have to come up with an innovative solution. Um, and, and, and there's a challenge for us. Because if we, if, if we can't fix that um, within the right time, that can have an impact on the completion of the Stirling Dunblin Alloa uh, uh, project. So... Stelling Dunlan Alloa is really important for us um, because after we've completed Edinburgh to Glasgow, Stelling Dunlan Alloa is necessary as the next project to allow for the introduction of our new fleets. And so we have allowed extended rules of the route access on Edinburgh to Glasgow to be able to start Stelling Dunlan Alloa earlier. The structures and clearing the issue at Stirling Station itself will be uh, a really important part of finding... And is that forward. having an impact on cost and budget, or is it just purely a technical question and timing? It has a potential risk to impact on cost. Can I just clarify that? Just, just for, for, for other people, you said protected structure. I, I'm assuming that you mean it's listed. Yes, listed structure. And, yeah. and so you're in discussion with Historic Scotland on, on, on that? Absolutely. And, and the, the issue, therefore, is that you can't make the track any lower... That's You're right. going to have to work out a way of lifting the whole structure up. That, that's actually that's correct because, in terms of in terms of trying to create, there, there are two problems with with to a certain extent you can lower the track, but there are two challenges with that. The one challenge is you can only lower the track up to a point where you then get people egressing from a train, seeing a platform that's not at the right alliance, uh, alignment. So so that's a limit of what you can do. But the real problem we have under the Stirling footbridge is um, the physical clearance from someone standing on the platform to the overhead line, um, the live overhead conductor. And so lowering track doesn't do anything for you in that regard. Um, and therefore, it is really important for us to find a way to lift it. And yes, we're dealing with... Uh, we're dealing so with so it sounds like a pragmatic solution is required. And, exactly and, and, right. And, I see Stuart's wanted to come in probably to offer that, Stuart. Yeah, so. uh, well, it, it sort of was. I was just wondering if you were looking at the Paisley Canal solution, which uh, solved that problem with a bridge by putting a dead section in. Now, I, I can understand in the area where trains are actually going to be stopping, it get, got it in but... Mind. But I can give you my own back of the envelope uh, thoughts on that if you no, really no. wish. Got anyone? That is one of the options, by the way. Yeah, OK. Thank you. Sorry, uh, we, we digressed a bit, and, and John had a further part of the question yeah, well, to ask. My next one was uh, about the ORR again, um, raising questions about the procurement strategy uh, for electrification, uh, the rolling programme. Um, I mean, can you just give us an assurance that we are getting best value for money through your procurement programme? Yeah, uh, that's a, 
That's a really good question. And it's a question that for a large part of last year um, was a key part of our strategic overview of electrification projects in, in Scotland. As you'll recall, when we started to find the problems on, on the ENG program, and as we fixed them, one of the challenges that, that, that I had to our teams were to what extent is the, is the creation of an infrastructure delivery alliance group, therefore, where the contractors to our network rail business was in an alliance with our network rail business to deliver something, or should it be a, an arm's length contract, which is a more conventional way of contracting? And which one of those were going to deliver the right value, the right program delivery, and the right cost for us? Um, so it was a big part of our focus last year. And we did go to the market to test the market on whether an arm's length delivery would be cheaper or more cost effective than the alliance um, that we had set up with uh, uh, companies such as Costain and Morgan Sindel, who's in our current alliance to deliver ENG electrification. And we did conclude after that exercise that the best value was through an alliance and that the best program delivery was through an alliance. And that is why we have continued that delivery on SDA. And I think the sense check for, the, um, for us on this is if you make a comparison of the unit rates of electrification projects in network rail, then Scotland's uh, electrification projects have the lowest unit rate in, 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 in network rail. And, and that is an important benchmark of whether we're delivering value for money. Thank you. And the next one. Uh, well, actually, John, I'm, um, the, the next question, there's a lot of people queuing up to ask the question. So I'm going to let Peter start it off. And then, because I know you've got an interest, as have many others. So I'm going to let Peter start it off, bring you in afterwards, if I may. Peter. Thanks, convener. Um, we all know that uh, the Minister Humza Youssef announced uh, in December that the monthly and annual season ticket holders were going to get a, f get a free week of travel in ScotRail services at some point during this coming year. And uh, my, I just wonder what involvement the, the ScotRail Alliance had in, in the development of these proposals and uh, for the free week of travel that was announced by Mr Youssef. So we are developing the methodology to achieve that. Um, and sort of the, the detail of how we're going to actually offer it and what shape it's going to get offered and how it gets implemented. Um, so the offer, is, the offer the minister made is, is, is clearly um, an initiative that trans the Scottish government have decided um, they want to implement. Mm. Um, and we are now looking at how to go work with the existing systems to actually make this practicable and to implement it in a way which is acceptable to the Scottish Government. And so we're de developing options. We've submitted those options for TS, and, and there's a process of discussion um, to see how we achieve that. Mm. Okay, so, so, just so I can drill this down a wee bit before bringing John in on it, is, is the question I believe you were asked by Peter, is what, how, what was your involvement in the development of these proposals? What you're telling us is your involvement in the development post the proposals are announced. What Peter, I think, is, and, and the committee would like to know, is before the announcement, what was your, or Scott Rail's involvement in the announcement? Did you know it was coming? Yes. And, and you'd worked out a way of delivering it before it was announced? It's not. In terms of working out how it's to be delivered is something that needed more time than the, um, the, the period we had to decide how to physically implement it. Okay, so how long was that period that you were given to decide that it was a good idea? The period of conversation was uh, two to three weeks. Two to three weeks before it was, it was going to be announced. We and were aware that something, that so we, were, we were asked to consider how something like that could be implemented. Sorry, I think we need to choose our words very carefully here. You were aware or you were included in the discussions on whether it was a good idea and were thinking about how you could implement it two to three weeks before the Minister announced it to the Parliament? It's not for us to decide whether it's a good idea or not. I, I, it's a policy decision by the Scottish Government. I understand so we, that. I'll rephrase that. So two to three weeks before the Minister made the announcement in the Parliament, you were included in the discussions on, on, on this and how you were going to develop the delivery of it. That's correct. 
Okay, John, do you want to push a bit more on that? Right, well, the, the bit I'm interested in uh, is, is the actual funding of it. Now, what we've been told is it's costing three million and all I've had so far uh, was a written uh, response, I think, from the government, which said, if I quote, the first 1.8 million of the funding is to be provided by ScotRail from funds it already holds. And I'm, I'm very unclear what that means. Uh, is, that, is that just a kind of general fund that you've got? And if we spend 1.8 million on this, it means there'll be 1.8 million less for barriers or, or something else. Can, can you explain what that 1.8 million is? Yes, so the request that the Scottish Government has made um, to us as Abellio ScotRail is to use money from what's called the Squire Fund. Squire is a service quality regime, um, a very good service quality regime that is implemented only in Scotland and not anywhere else in England and Wales. And it has a very high rate of performance that we need to achieve. And when we don't, then values, we pay values of money into the Squire Fund. And we declare that every, I think TS uh, published that every quarter, and that fund becomes a fund which we jointly decide um, where it's best to invest in. The contractual position is really that the decision sits with the Bellio ScotRail where to invest it, and we are currently working with the Scottish Government to understand how to fund um, this, uh, the, the, the three million that they've identified. We've not finalized those conversations yet, but those conversations are happening between us and Transport Scotland. So could you tell us what the balance in the Square Fund is at the moment? I think it's just under a million. I'm not sure. Right, so it's not huge, am I no, sitting there? It's not under um, a million. Right, so, so this, that fund is going to be used for improvements of some kind. That's correct. And so the decision is just that, it's, it's, so it's, we're not getting new money here, we're just allocating some of that fund to the 1.8 million for the fare reduction. That is the proposal of Transport Scotland. Right. Clearly, we have, we would have, we have plans and we, um, to have used that, those funds on other initiatives, such as more gate lines in particular locations and the like. And, um, yeah, that fund wouldn't go far with, to, to provide infrastructure such as access for all, but yes, other locations. Sorry, okay. so, so, you, so before I move to Mike, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to analyze the, the, the point that you made earlier is, is that you, you've now uh, had the announcement and you've been working on the delivery of it. Have, have you come up with proposals on, on how you're going to fulfill the uh, minister's promise? Yes, we've come up with initial suggestions. And it's, it's, it's all in the detail of, and I'll give you a practical example. People buy um, annual season tickets throughout the year. So how, how and when do you give them that week free? Do you make the week free that they pay for four, uh, they pay for a week less when they buy the ticket? Or do you give them, when you buy your season ticket, you have a week longer? So it's detail like that that must be married up to what the industry systems can, can manage. Sort of, does the, does, does the system that manage the issuing of tickets, can it accommodate that type of solution. So we are in that phase of thinking through the practicalities of delivering this. So there'll be a lot of people that won't be able to come up with the, the cost of a season ticket and have to buy their tickets uh, you know, on a regular basis rather than on an annual basis. Uh, how does that work? How, I mean, are they ignored? So, this, the, the so I'm, I'm just asking about, you know, we're, we're, we're saying, you, are you limiting it as purely to season ticket holders? It's limited to annual season ticket holders and monthly season ticket holders. And that's the policy of the Scottish Government, and we are looking at how to implement that. Okay, Mike was next, and then I, I've got people queuing up all over the place. Thank you, Commissioner. And, and sorry, I'm just going to say uh, to the committee, because the Minister is unable to, to be here, I, I'm not limiting it, I think, because this is a significantly important mm. thing, so yes. Mike. Thank you, Convener. I am confused. Uh, as an MSP, when the Minister made this announcement, I assumed that this was a Scottish Government initiative and it would be Scottish Government money 
taxpayers' money, and part of the, the government's money, that we'll be paying for this. You have just said to us now that the decision about paying this money rests with you, Abelio Scott Rail. And when the questions were asked, what, what engagement did you have with this, um, this initiative hasn't come from you. This, as, as far as, I want to make it clear so that we, there's no misunderstanding here. This is not your decision. It is not your initiative. This is an initiative from the Scottish Government, but it's not new money that the Scottish Government is using. It's money that you were going to invest in the railways. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Rumbles, that's correct. So the, the Squire Fund is, a, is, is very well defined within our contract, and it's very clear that we invest the Squire Fund um, in the railway in initiatives that benefit customers. Yes, but it's, it's your fund. It's, it's, um, it's, the decision rests with you, is what you said. So, yes. We consult clearly with Transport Scotland in terms of anything we do on the network. And so if a proposal is made to us um, to consider alternatives way, alternative ways to implement funds from the Squire Fund, um, we consider that. And so I think if there are further... There shouldn't be... There shouldn't be too much of a debate around this in the sense that well, what we want to do here is we want to deliver something for customers yeah, yeah, that's good that, for customers. That, that is exactly my point, that you have designed this fund to deliver for the better service for our customers and your, your decision, and that's what you're aiming to do with this money. Along comes the government minister and says to you, I have a bright idea, I want to give a week's free travel to people and asks you to implement it. This is how I understand what's going on here. Uh, and I don't personally, my view is that I think this is completely inappropriate because it, it's surely it is your decision how you think this money should be spent and not the government's decision, surely? Is that not undue influence? Uh, Mike, sorry, I, I, I think we've got to be careful in the sense that it, it is a question that we should be putting to the minister and, and pushing the I minister on. Uh, I think but, Convener, may I just say, that's a very appropriate point to put to the minister, but I want to hear from the other side of this coin. Well, uh, I think what we need to hear is, is where the money's coming from, which we've yes. heard, and what it would have been used for if it wasn't being used for this scheme that the minister has suggested. So, and, and, and if there's something you want to, to, to delve on that or, or add to that, Phil, yeah, I'm if, very if, happy to. If I could just add something to it. Um, I can see where Mr. Rommels is taking the question, um, and, I, and I definitely think there's uh, a question that I would probably not be able to answer fully. But I think this is, this is simpler than, 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 than what people may think it is. We have a very constructive relationship with Transport Scotland and with the Scottish Government, a very open relationship. Now, while we may set priorities of what we think would be best for customers, if Transport Scotland engages with us and makes alternative suggestions, of course, we consider that. And I don't think there's anything inappropriate about that. I think what is important is only one thing, and that is customers in the end. And, and so we'll do whatever is necessary to deliver what's best for the customer. Um, if there are bigger questions that you'd like to answer in terms of whether it's new money or old money, I, I can't answer right. that. I've only got one supplementary to that, if I may. A big, um, the, you, the point you have just made, this is really important. You, you, you said you want to do the best for the customer and that you have this fund to do just that. Before the minister suggested that you use this money in this way, you had never thought, am I correct, that you had never thought about giving free travel for a period of time to your uh, ho ticket holders. That's correct. Right. Thank you. I think, I th I think that's, that's a, it. That, that's yeah. a I mean, that's quite extraordinary because I was going to say this is policy made on the back of a fag packet, but I don't think it's even reached that stage of development. Um, we were told that the figure was 1.8 million that ScotRail would be contributing to this scheme. You said the Square Fund holds less or around a million. Where's the other 0.8 million or, or so, other million possibly coming from? The Square Fund has a certain value to date but it can be anticipated that over the next couple of months um, and over the next six months or a year that further, that this fund would grow. So you don't expect this policy to come into fruition for six months to a year, which would mean the Square Fund would be up to 1.8? I, I think the policy and the solution can be implemented. The cost for that doesn't 
hit all at once. Okay. So it can be implemented and funded over a period of time. So it's on the never never as well. Sorry. I wouldn't agree I with that. Be put in that I wouldn't agree with that. that yeah. I put that question to the minister. I think it's know. perfectly feasible to implement a solution and and to have uh, different types of solutions of how to fund it. And as I've indicated before, we are in a in the process of discussing this in detail with Transport Scotland, and uh, it'll come. Uh, it'll be resolved in the next couple of weeks. Jamie, I think you want to ask a question. Uh, on this or, or my on this on, on this specific okay on this specific thing. So, um, I, I don't want to leave this room uh, feeling more confused than I, when I walked into it, but I, I, I feel like I am at the moment. So, we, if the estimated cost of the three-week travel is around three million, and the suggestion is that 1.8 of that will come from funds which you hold or may hold in the future, and presumably the Scottish government, and we can ask the minister in due course, will fulfil the rest of the cost of that. Uh, do you have the ability to say to the Transport Minister, no, that 1.8 million should have and would be best used for other things that we had it earmarked for? And again, you, you, you can't say whether it's a good or bad idea because it's a policy announcement made by the government, but surely you are in control of those funds. Um, what would you say to the Minister? The decision on where we spend the Squire funds is for us to decide upon as a Bellio Scotrail. And that decision is executed by us in consultation with Transport Scotland. Um, so if there, if there are schemes that we would want to do differently, that discussion will be had by Transport Scotland, with Transport Scotland. There's no <coughs> confusion here. This is standard contract management principles. So we'll manage the contract, consult, work with a client and work out what's the best to deliver. So you can't say to the uh, minister, if you want to make a policy announcement that costs three million, then it's up to you to pay for it because we've, re we've ring-fenced that money for other things. If, that is a, if, 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 if we feel that that is the right approach to follow, that's an approach we can follow. Understood, thank you. Well, do you think that's the right approach to follow? I mean, you say that the decision... Uh, is SQUIRE, by the way, an acronym for something, or is it just called the SQUIRE Fund? SQUIRE Fund, no, it's a service quality regime, so SQUIRE okay. fits into that, so it's an acronym. So there's one million or so in it that may go up, impossibly, and you can, if you like, because you're a commercial company, say to the minister, you're not having it. You said that. Are you going to do that? I prefer not to commit to something now well, because I think, we still, I, I no, think if, it, if, I can, if I can just say where we are, we are busy discussing this with Transport Scotland and I prefer not to commit to a position yet. Right, so, so the scheme might not go ahead because you've not decided, yes, we're going to do this. I can't vouch for where the scheme goes ahead or well, not. There we are. I can, I, can, I, I can just comment on whether whether we will make that decision and when we'll make that decision in the next couple of weeks in terms of how we will deploy the Squire Fund. If the scheme is dependent on a contribution from the Squire Fund, it is open to ScotRail Abelio to refuse to release that money and the scheme will have to proceed on the basis of funding coming from elsewhere. Is that correct? I don't foresee that, really. No, but is that correct? Well, I'll just answer the question. Well, that was I don't question. foresee that. No, I didn't ask you if you foresaw it. I asked you if it was correct that the fund, if you're not giving the funding, presumably the funding has to come from elsewhere. Is that correct? Yes, but it's not my funding. It's not for me to decide where it comes from. No, but so who decides about the Squire Fund transport? The Squire Fund we decide upon, but the funding for this initiative is no, no, not... No, no, no. I understand that, but there's a contribution from the Squire Fund. There's a possible contribution from the Squire Fund. You've said it's up to ScotRail Abelio whether or not that contribution is put forward. You've not agreed yet to do it. So if you do not agree to do it, it therefore should follow logically that that contribution must come from elsewhere. Is that correct? I, I, I think that's quite. I, I think that's quite. Different. I mean, it, 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 if Follows it's not it going to come from the Squire Fund, it's going to have to come from Correct. elsewhere. Well, the question is whether it should come from 
resource, other resources right. within the railways or whether it should come from the Scottish Government. And I think realistically, Christy, that's a question that we should ask the Minister. And I, I think we should ask him right, sooner rather than later. But I will allow you another there's quick a, There's a couple of other things is that concerns me is that this announcement has been made. You're a person with a season ticket. And now it seems the mood music or the smoke billowing up is that delay is happening because this has not been thought through and that delay will be dependent on somehow this money coming together on the Squire Fund. Now, is that part of the reason why it's taking so long is that the money isn't there anyway? <coughs> okay. <coughs> Set last one then is, has anybody calculated the cost of administration of this scheme and it, who would be liable for the cost of the administration? So the cost of developing a solution um, is part of the solution itself. So the cost of implementing whatever offer we make to, um, to customers is included in the, uh, in, in, in the three million. And obviously we are working hard right. to keep that cost as low as possible, to come with a solution as quickly as possible, and to deliver a, a workable answer to, um, to Transport Scotland for implementation across the network as quickly as possible. So the three million includes cost of administration? It does. Thank you. So, but uh, but uh, uh, if I could just close this, if I may, and move on to the final thing. I think there are various questions here, some serious questions, which the committee feels, I, I believe from, from our conversations here, that we need to address specifically to the minister, I I including how the policy was formulated, where the funds are coming from, who will suffer as a result of the funds being taken from things such as the Squire Fund. And I think these are all relevant questions for the committee. And I'd reiterate that it's a, it's a sadness that the Minister is unwell and unable to come to the committee. So we will need to schedule that meeting as, as soon as possible after this so we can get the answers, because I think this is a very, very important subject. Now, there are two final questions. One, one from Stuart and then one from Jamie. And if I could ask you both to be as brief as possible, I'd be very grateful. Um, the question, I'll give you the question and then I'll need to explain why I'm asking it. The question is, are you satisfied uh, with the national rail conditions of travel as a means of communicating to customers uh, what they may or may not use their tickets for? And the reason I ask that question is very specific but will be more general in other circumstances. Um, if one has a ticket uh, and wishes to break one's journey, spend some time in an intermediate place for some hours and resume one's journey, it's very difficult to work out if the ticket you're holding does that. Let me be specific. In the back of the ticket, it says, issued according to national rail conditions of carriage. So far, so good. You look at national conditions of rail carriage, they simply say most tickets allow you to break your journey, and then when a break of journey is allowed, da-da. They don't explain anything about that. So then you consider what ScotRail's own website says. Um, can I make a break in your, my journey? It's one of the questions one can ask. It simply says whether or not you are permitted to break your journey depends on ticket type. It also makes the suggestion that when you book your ticket, you can find out what the conditions are. I'm unable to establish how that can be done, and I've spent some time on it. Do you think that actually passengers are as well informed as they should be, and is there not a real danger given the, the difficulties in pinning down sometimes fine detail uh, that people are overpaying for tickets? And I, I will just qualify all this by saying IATA in the aviation industry have 7,000 plus conditions. So the railway is doing a bit better than that, I suspect, but perhaps not good enough. A brief answer uh, to a complicated question with, 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 with lots of supplementaries and detail that would be very appreciated. If you approach any of our ticket offices, um, I am always amazed at how superbly supportive our employees are, how knowledgeable they are on our different ticket types and how keen they are to support travellers in their decisions. Our ticket office staff will respond to a question such as, how, what is the lowest cost ticket from point A to point B for me and will help customers to actually buy the lowest cost ticket, which is what customer service is about. So you're right. Um, 
just to go on the, the conditions of travel um, is, 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 is about loads of rules and loads of specifics and details. We can either, customers can either talk to our booking office staff directly or talk to our, our helpline and, and we will endeavor to get people the information they need. I'll just say I hate the phone and my local ticket office is part time. And I'll leave it at that. Jamie. Uh, uh, I'll, keep, I'll, I'll, keep it, I'll keep it brief. I just elevated you there. Uh, for, uh, I'd also like to thank Mr. Verster for his extended uh, appearance here today, taking the place, uh, in some cases, of the Minister. But a uh, very uh, selfish question. Uh, unfortunately, January has been a difficult month for people in my region in the West, uh, with three separate lines uh, uh, experiencing real, uh, real replacement bus, those three dreaded words that no one wants to hear in a January. Um, could I just ask for a quick update on where you're at with with uh, those closures, the Guruk, uh, Weems Bay, obviously, the, the air line, and also the Adrosan line as well, because it has also has a knock-on effect on people going to and from Arran, and that extended bus travel is, is, is a problem there. So maybe just a brief update on that, and some assurances that that will end on the 5th of February as planned. Um, and a second point, very briefly, on a num number of complaints I've had from people on uh, toilets, which are out of order, both on trains and at stations. Um, and it's really important to mention that because I've had representation from, for example, Crohn's and colitis and IBS, IBD networks, who say this is a real problem for commuters and one that uh, the people who suffer from conditions uh, do face, um, as well as normal commuters as well. So if you wouldn't mind commenting on those briefly, thank you. If I start with the latter, in order to achieve our introduction of the new fleets, we had to take four class 380s, which is the modern electrified Siemens train, off the Inverclyde services in order to do driver training. This is unfortunately just the harsh realities of introducing a new fleet. And in order to achieve this rapid program of introduction, um, we have quite a lot of diesel train drivers on the central belt that will now have to become familiar with electric trains. Mm -hmm. and, and so that is why we had to um, replace those 380s with class 314s. Um, and, and yes, uh, we appreciate that this is a different product. It's a product we've got, unfortunately. It's the product we can use. Um, it's not really possible to go and find another new train available, standing, doing nothing, somewhere else in the United Kingdom or anywhere else that we can run on, 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 on our railway at the times and programs that we are implementing stuff. So it was always intended that we would have this shift in rolling stock during, um, during the period of training. And uh, it'll take some time before we return um, class 380s um, to that part of the network. But the class 314s, we hand back um, December 18. in December 18. <coughs> so that is a product which we have bought as part of the franchise um, and that we had inherited and that we will replace. And, and that, is the, that is because it is in the long run, not the product that we would want on our railway anymore. And so the introduction program is really critical and, and we, we, we focus all of our attention to get the new fleets in as quickly as possible to get those units out. In terms of the network itself, as, as, you, as you're aware that we are running some of our test trains on, 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 on the Gurukh service, but that none of the lines in the West are closed um, and unavailable for service. So we, we will at times, Adrosan for example, will be affected by stormy, stormy weather and we will have poss possibility that we can't run electric trains and, and, and that, that would be the type of thing that we deal with on an ongoing basis. But we inform customers very clearly when that happens and how it happens. So our focus remains to provide the service for all parts of the network that we've committed to. Thank you. And on the issue of... Um uh, the lack of um, conveniences on trains and at stations. The, the lack of conveniences? Yeah, so my second point was about a um, uh, uh, lack of uh, operating public uh, toilets, both at stations and on trains. It's a common problem that, that we get um, complaints from from constituents and groups. Yeah, so on the class 314s on, station, on, on trains, um, it is our... It is our our approach to replace those trains with trains that have toilets on them. So, so that's really important. In terms of uh, um, 
conveniences or toilet facilities at stations. Through, throughout, throughout the United Kingdom and many other railways have adopted the practice to provide toilets um, on, on trains rather than, especially on the longer distance journeys, rather than always at stations, except at stations which are really big and real, really big conurbations of where people, where people gather. And the reason for that is very, very practical and very pragmatic, and that is that um, to toilet facilities aren't always supervised, can't always be controlled, and, and in different, different parts of the network, um, we don't even have manned stations that we can provide um, that level of control to, to, the, to those facilities. So the facilities we can control and assist people with and, and, uh, and have a presence at are those that are on trains. And, and, and that's a standard policy. Um, and, and that's sort of a standard trend uh, throughout the railway industry throughout. And, and we will continue with that. Okay. I, I, I think by, by what you're saying that the fact that where, where there are trains without toilets and stations, therefore now without toilets, the importance of having operable toilets on trains that, that are functionable and clean is of vital importance. And I think that is the point yeah. that yeah. you've accepted and, 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 and Jamie's making. Uh, can I thank you uh, for the rather extended session no and apologize for it, but actually I don't apologize for it because I think there were some very important points raised. And before I... Uh, conclude this part of the meeting, I wondered if there was any statement that you would like to make, having given evidence uh, to the committee today. Not really. Just to say that for us, it's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity to keep on showcasing to, to this committee what it is we do. I really do welcome the scrutiny and the questions, and I hope it helps to um, broaden the understanding of the complexities of what we deal with. And to be honest, um, at times it'll be great to have more support and vocal support from people like this committee about what it is we do and uh, with the po positive spirit in which we continue to do that and deliver for our customers in Scotland. Because you are opinion formers and it's important for us that the opinions there do understand, reflect the fact that we do 100% um, focus on, on Scotland's railway. Okay, well, I, I'd like you to thank you, Phil, and your team for attending today. We certainly look forward to the updates that you've mentioned that you will write to us about on questions that you didn't answer during the committee stage. And uh, we also would welcome the chance, as you, as you indeed has offered today, to have updates from the ScotRail Alliance in future uh, at times which you consider and we consider important that we're kept informed of ongoing positions. Now, I would normally suspend the meeting at this stage, but because the minister is unable to attend, that does in fact conclude our meeting, and I'd like to go into a very brief closed session, uh, to informal session afterwards with the committee. So thank you very much, and thank you to your team.